Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Rishi and the organizers, for uh, giving me this opportunity to present to you. As I was listening to the presentations about the undergraduate research, I was reminded of my own undergraduate research and my mentor, who had a very important influence in my life that was back in Presidency College in Calcutta. And um, I learned something very important as a result of that. I, I think of it now as sort of a transition from... Um, what, I, what I learned from this, uh, uh, from this uh, mentor and, and from doing the research was um, you can really ask questions for yourself. It marked a transition from receiving wisdom from books, from people, uh, reading books, to reading the book of nature, if you will. I, I, it was thrilling to find out that you can ask questions yourself, you can figure things out. You don't really need to rely on what other people tell you. And uh, it's kind of a subversive thing to say, but whenever I meet students, I always say, you know, question everything, find out for yourself. That doesn't mean be disrespectful, you know, a lot of, you don't want to figure out everything that humans have learned over the last few thousand years by yourself, it, it'll be more efficient to, <laughs> to uh, um, you know, sometimes uh, uh, listen to what other people have had to say. But um, if knowledge is a vast forest, we have cleared a little bit of it. And research is sort of at the edge of that forest, and you're trying to cut down some more trees, and there's always more to be done. Um, and the most exhilarating thing, there are many things that give us pleasure, but perhaps the purest pleasure is that of figuring something out by yourself for the first time and having that aha moment of uh, problem solving. So uh, it's really great to kind of hear some of that uh, today. And um, I want to tell you uh, a bit about project uh, that I'm running to map out the circuits of the mouse brain. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm doing it. Um, and um, you're here at a college to, to gather knowledge, knowledge about the world, about yourselves. Um, and this is something that, you know, from ancient times, of course, has, has been uh, something that the sages have told us. Rishi means sage, so I guess uh, uh, <laughs> shout out to uh, Rishi there. Um, in the uh, Temple of Apollo at uh, Delphi, it uh, was inscribed, Gnoti uh, Syautan, know yourself. The, um, the, in Sanskrit, there's Atmanang with the, these ideas, of course, cross-cultural. There's nothing really new to them. The thing that drives us today drove people a long time ago. I, I was just uh, um, Googling uh, Gnothi, and I found out that, well, there's a Proto-Indo-European root Gno, which is also related to Sanskrit Gnanam. Um, and that was interesting because instead of going to the oracle at Delphi, I was going to Google, right? So that's a modern-day uh, oracle. Um, and uh, to Wikipedia, but it, it sort of uh, made me ask a question. Uh, there's all this knowledge in the internet, but does the internet know anything? Would anyone here say that the internet actually knows something? Um. No. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's like asking, does a tape recorder know music? Well, not really. I mean, it can sing it, uh, but there's this interesting difference, right? Um, so people say the internet is a brain, that's a loose way people put it, but you know, if you start thinking about it, it uh, doesn't really make sense, right? You don't need a lot of technical knowledge to see that that doesn't make sense. Um, th there's a more uh, sort of maybe sophisticated question, and people say, well, the brain is a computer. Um, and uh, one can ask that question, how, how many people here think the brain is a computer? Um, well, one person, two. How many people would say the brain is not a computer? Uh, there's a few, and then there's several undecided. <laughs> well, you know, now one of the things is to ask these questions in a logical way. It's not just a statement of authority. You don't want somebody to tell you the brain's a computer, or, you know, what's your feeling about whether the brain's a computer or not. Uh, we need to find out what computers are. So you have to define what computers are, see what properties they have. Uh, then you can ask, uh, do brains have that property? And if they do, then they are computers. If not, they don't, right? So now, um, so what is a computer? It's the first task. Um, well, that's a, uh, we can spend a lot of time talking about that, but let's take this uh, definition, um, which is a, a Turing machine. 
Uh, are there people in the audience who know what a Turing machine is? And please don't be shy. You've heard of a Turing machine. Oh, there's a, there's a couple people. Um, so the uh, Turing machine is a model of computation that Alan Turing made. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Alan Turing. But instead of asking whether the brain is a computer, a more concrete technical question would be, uh, can I model the brain usefully using a Turing machine? Now, to answer this question, uh, there is the following simple yes, no uh, question that will help us understand this. So let me ask you this question. Uh, only a few people know what a Turing machine is, so it'll have to be confined to those people. Um, but the rest of you can feel free to respond. Uh, does a Turing machine accept inputs while it is computing? Is the answer yes? How many people think the answer is yes? Um, you think the answer is yes? And how many people think the answer is no? Some, some people think the answer is no. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> Turing machines do not accept inputs while computing. You, Turing machine is kind of like what you think a computer is. You give it a problem, you write it down on a tape, and then you go away. You don't interrupt it while it is working. Um, it, can, it sits and thinks for a while, and uh, thinks in a very mechanical way. Um, and uh, it eventually halts and gives you an answer. Or it doesn't halt. It goes into this loop and just keeps stuck in there forever, right? But you can't interrupt it. Well, brains are not like that, right? I'm constantly uh, being interrupted. I'm, I'm talking to you. Your brain is receiving input. So, you know, at the very sort of basic conceptual level, a Turing machine is not fitting as, as a model of the brain. So the next time people tell you the brain's a computer, you know, do a double take. Think about Turing machines. Um, now, here's the irony. Most of the things that we call computers also take inputs. Like you're typing away at them, they're attached to the internet. So the Turing machine is not a very good model of operating systems or all these things that computers do. So, in fact, computer scientists have been exploring so-called models of interactive uh, computing, uh, non-Turing models of computing. Now, here's the interesting thing. Turing himself thought about the brain a lot. That's how he came up with the notion of the Turing machine in the first place. He took a year off. He was very successful. He cracked the code, uh, cryptographic code, during the war. And um, he uh, got a bit of time to himself. He took some time off. And uh, then he wrote this paper called Intelligent Machinery in 1948. This was amazing. Uh, he came up with the idea of neural networks, of uh, genetic algorithms, you know, trainable neural networks, and so on and so forth. He took this paper to his supervisor, and the supervisor heavily criticized him. There were some smudges on this paper. It was not well typed. Um, he didn't like that. And uh, these are some comments that the supervisor made. He said, a bit thin for a year off. This cool <laughs> boy's essay, not suitable for publication. <laughs> Poor Turing never published this paper. So when somebody discourages you about your research, Keep in mind that you know, other people have been discouraged as well. If you have conviction about it, you know, go for it. Uh, but don't fool yourself, of course. Um, so Turing never published his paper, which and he you know, passed away. Uh, uh, it was published posthumously. It is available freely on the web. Please go read it. It's, it's a fun to read. So brains are not computers in the sense of Turing machines. And this is, in fact, what makes brains so interesting to study. We actually don't have good models of what brains are, how to think about them. But brains are, if you want, intelligent machines. So one reason to study brains is to find out uh, how nature designs intelligent machines, how, how does the process of evolution come up with intelligent um, machines. Now, people have been studying the brain for a while. So it's not a new enterprise. And the last 100 years have seen some pretty profound advances, but we are still um, at early stages. It's kind of like, in some ways, we know a lot, uh, but in some ways, it's like uh, chemistry in the days of alchemy. We don't quite know how to think about it. Um, there are many theories. It's not like there are not theories. One theory which has been very um, useful is the so-called place theory. And the place theory basically says that different parts of your brain do different things. That's a very simple theory. You've got a visual part of your brain. It is useful for seeing. Um, and it, theory goes back uh, a long time ago. People had ideas about phrenology. They would read bumps on the skull. And uh, this is an illustration from the 15th century. 
um, you can see, um, you know, I guess this illustrator thought that memory uh, lived back here. Um, but, okay, the Im imagination lived here. Now, we've moved away from that. But uh, the place theory still holds sway. Uh, uh, how many of you have heard of Phineas Gage? Um, some of you. So there was the strange case of Phineas Gage. Uh, there was an accident. Uh, he was working, uh, I think, to lay down uh, a railroad. And this uh, iron rod that he's holding, uh, uh, there was an explosion, and this rod went straight through his head, landed on the other side. You can see here a reconstruction of uh, how the rod went through his head. He was still actually conscious, walked to the hospital or something like that, and then collapsed. So uh, it was amazing, because there are some other parts of the brain where if you knock it out, you're not going to be conscious and walking to the brain, I mean, walking to the hospital. Um, and um, one of the remarkable things that uh, people found out after uh, this accident was Phineas Gage. Even though he otherwise seemed fine, he started having these uh, personality differences. He was a different person from uh, who he was before he had had that accident. And so even something as uh, um, if, you, if you want um, seemingly fuzzy or uh, ill-defined as personality traits, uh, could be localized in some parts of the brain. That's what people realized. And we've been learning about the brain one lesion at a, at a time. If you have a, a stroke or uh, some damage, you might lose a particular function, right? So there is something to this place theory. However, it's not a very um, uh, insightful theory. It's a useful theory uh, because the brain is really a circuit. So thinking about the brain in terms of places is a bit like thinking about um, a country in terms of the cities, but not uh, thinking about the roads that connect um, these cities. And even though I kind of ruled out the computer as a good uh, model, uh, at least the Turing model as a good model for the brain, um, nevertheless, it's something like that in the sense that it's made up of circuits and parts. And um, what it does, uh, whatever its function is, comes out of this circuitry. And um, we don't know what those circuits are for the most part. After all these years of research, our knowledge of brain circuitry remains quite incomplete in a way that I will illustrate for you in a minute. But let me first say that there's some part of your nervous system circuitry that we do understand well, and that's your peripheral nervous system. This is the part of the nervous system that uh, talks to the rest of your body, to the viscera, um, and a lot of medicine of, is, of course, predicated on understanding this uh, peripheral uh, nervous system. Uh, we actually know uh, quite little. Um, here's sort of a representation of the uh, connection matrix, if you want, of the rat brain at a fairly coarse uh, level of resolution, something that I call the mesoscale. Resolution. I don't want you to look at the details. All I want to look at all the gray. The gray is where we don't have information. So I'm not going to go into detail, but it just tells you there's a lot of places where we don't have information about uh, connectivity. And now contrast that with the uh, genome. So, of course, now we have lots of knowledge about the genome. The human genome has been mapped. The rat genome has been mapped. Um, uh, just uh, today I read that the silkanth uh, genome has been mapped. So lots of genomes have been mapped, but um, not many brains have been mapped in that way. Uh, there is exactly one species for which we have more or less a full circuit diagram at some level, uh, only for one or two individuals, and that's the uh, worm, uh, the C. elegans. It's got a few hundred neurons. So early days in that sense. And that's a gap that uh, struck me. I'm a theoretical physicist, physicist by background, so I like uh, to think in terms of big pictures, and that's sort of a gap that really struck me, and I uh, set out to try to address it. Now, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of scale, that's the human brain. It's a mouse brain right there. It's about a thousand mouse brains will fit into one human brain, because the human brain's about a liter, and uh, mouse brain's about one cc. Uh, mice are pretty intelligent. Um, that's a macaque monkey halfway in between. So let's look inside a cross-section of a mouse brain. So this is 
um, I'm going to zoom in into this cross section. And as I zoom in, you are going to start seeing neurons. Um, so this is the part of the brain that's called the uh, cortex. And uh, what you are seeing here are individual, these uh, dark bodies. They are the cell bodies of the neurons. That's where the nucleus sets a lot of the cellular uh, machinery. Now, notice all this white space uh, between the neurons. Can anyone tell me what's going on in that white space? What's there in that white space? Myelin, uh, so that's, it's myelinated, and what is myelinated? Glial There's glial cells. What is myelinated? Axons. Axons, right? So most of that white stuff is where the wires are. You can't see that in this picture, but uh, let's go to another um, uh, um, uh, cross-section. This time the myelinated fibers are actually visualized, so not all axons are myelinated, but some axons, wires, have got this myelin sheet on them, which we can visualize. Um, and again, we are zooming in. Um, you will see, this is now we are back in cortex. You can see myelinated axons running in a crisscross um, pattern. Um, so there are cell bodies, and then there are wires connecting these cells. And in fact, um, to get a little better feel for that kind of white space, uh, let's look at an electron micrograph. So here again, you see the cell bodies. Um, now you see the gray stuff. We are now zooming in um, more and more. And you start seeing the little fragments of the axons and the different bits and pieces of the cell. So this is what that white stuff is made up of. It's like a dense spaghetti of wires, a very dense spaghetti. And it's, it's very difficult, actually, to, to imagine um, the complexity of the structure. So I have made a little... Um, mental picture for you. Um, so let's think about the human brain. And let's talk about, let's try to zoom it up until you can start seeing the individual fibers. Now the myelinated fibers are a little thicker. Let's go to the unmyelinated fibers, which are a little thinner, between a tenth of a micron to a, to a, a micron. And let's zoom out the human brain until we can see those. It turns out you have to zoom out the human brain to about the size of a football field before you can do that. OK? Because these are very fine wires. So if you did that, now imagine something about a football field size, both in lateral dimension and in height. And now you're barely able to see the fibers. Right? So it is really that complicated. If you were to just take a walk through it, going from one part to another, you will lose track about what's going on. If you did that with the mouse brain, the mouse brain is a lot smaller, so you won't need the football field, but you need something the size of this room. So think of you know, something that big, and now you can just see the wires, right? So that, that's in some sense why it's so complicated to understand it. it. It's got all these parts to it. And unlike the other parts of your body, like your liver or your muscles, there are these interesting cells called neurons which send out very long wires. So what the brain does is really coming from the connectivity patterns of the brain and coming from these long wires. Now, I want to, again, help you visualize how long these wires really are. Um, this is a neuron in the mouse uh, posterior parietal cortex um, that has been traced. Now, that scale bar here is a millimeter, so this is most of the mouse brain, actually. So the neuron has its cell body there, and it's sending these branches far away to, to long distant parts of the brain. If we go to your motor cortex, somewhere around here, there are neurons that are sending axons down to your spinal cord. And in fact, like just one synapse away, you get to your hands. Um, um, so these very, very thin, very, very, very long wires and a dense tangle of them is what the brain is, is uh, uh, made out of. There's also local circuitry. Now, uh, we can't really visualize these wires in humans. We can do them in non-human animals because the technique that is needed to visualize these wires is invasive. Uh, so nobody has actually seen a full-sized human neuron. I would say that seeing one of those would be like going to the moon. So it, 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 it strikes you as crazy. Well, you've seen a human. You've seen a human brain. You can see that post-mortem. But to visualize a neuron, to fill it up, we can't really do that yet. So I, I had proposed uh, some years ago uh, with a group of scientists that um, 
we need to systematically start to address this knowledge gap. And we published this uh, position paper uh, saying that in model organisms, there are organisms that neuroscientists like to study, um, uh, like the mouse, we should uh, make a coordinated effort to uh, determine the uh, brain-wide uh, connectivity patterns at a mesoscale resolution. Um, this was done in 2000, um, we, we started this process in 2006, seven. so it takes a while to, to get these things going. Uh, the way we are doing it is um, a little bit like the shotgun approach to mapping genomes. So we do uh, what we call a grid-based approach to whole brain connection mapping. And the way it's done is we divide the brain up into a grid, so uh, roughly equidistant points. Um, and each grid point gets an injection of something called a tracer substance. Um, there are four different tracer substances we use. I'll show you examples. Um, what happens when you inject this tracer substance is that the neuron takes this tracer substance up, and then this tracer substance moves along the wires. So if it is being taken up the cell bodies, it moves along the wires to the distant regions where the axons are projecting. So that way we can visualize the outputs from a region or it can get taken up by the synaptic terminals and it, get, it moves up to the cell body. So then we can look at um, the cell bodies that are sending axons to the region where you have made your injection, right? So that's a basic technique. Um, some of the traces we use are viruses and they get into the neuron and they replicate and they fill up the neuron with uh, a green fluorescent protein which helps us um, visualize it. And then we... Um, do a, a processing of these brains to visualize, and the processing is uh, essentially one makes a brain salami. You chop the brain up into fine sections, and then you look at it under a microscope to, to visualize it. Um, and then the computational step. So just to give you an idea, here's a little video uh, showing uh, um, the pipeline that I have set up um, in my lab. Um, this uh, started, the lab was empty 2010, January, so it's been going on now for two and a half, three years. Uh, you can see the brains being cut, um, two mouse brains um, at a time. Uh, this is a method that um, we have actually uh, perfected in the lab. And um, uh, the sort of a layout of the lab, you can see that uh, there are these uh, um, uh, robotic devices which uh, really come from histopathology uh, in, in laboratories that we are now reusing. Um, uh, a lot of this was done previously by hand, but it's very laborious. Um, we use machines to speed it up. Um, and uh, uh, each of these boxes have a, a mouse brain in it, in, in glass slides. And this is a crucial step, the uh, digitization of all these uh, slides. So you take these brains, um, a box, box of slides, uh, load them up into the digital scanner, uh, and the brains get um, digitized. And then there's the whole... Um, you know, computational infrastructure that you need to manage um, all this data. If you go to brainarchitecture.org or mouse.brainarchitecture.org, I'll walk you a little bit through the website. You can look at the data for yourself. Um, we are putting it out before we have published it. Um, that's sort of the norm uh, nowadays. Um, so um, let me uh, uh, talk a, a little bit about... Uh, here's the grid, by the way. Um, so we divide the uh, brain up into... Um, uh, a grid, and um, the grid points are about half a millimeter apart, uh, so we are placing about uh, 250, 260 um, injections in one hemisphere of the brain. Um, one of the key enabling technologies uh, that is making this happen is not necessarily something that you would expect. It's just the cost of storage, data storage. So a mouse brain at the light microscope resolution, which is about a micron, um, is about one trillion uh, voxels. It's about a terabyte. So um, I'd uh, like some, uh, somebody to tell me how much a terabyte of uh, information costs to store in 1989, just before the decade of the brain. Any guesses? $500,000? $500,000? A million. A million? Uh, Wikipedia says 30 million. <laughs> 1989. I mean, at some point it wasn't even possible that there was not a terabyte of storage um, <clears throat> available in the entire <laughs> planet. So now you go to Best Buy. It'll soon appear on your, on your keychain. So that's a fundamental technological change that's enabling this project. Okay? So 
beginning of the decade of the brain, just to digitize and store a mouse brain, impractical, um, economically impractical. Today, possible. For the human brain, human brain is a thousand times bigger, that's a petabyte. Petabyte is still, you can't go to Best Buy. I mean, you could. <laughs> Soon you will, perhaps. Um, and what's driving is, oddly enough, is you know, video games and stuff like that, right? So the, this was not, people didn't drive down the cost of storage because they wanted to study the brain. <laughs> but we can take advantage uh, of that. Okay, so this is what uh, tracer injections uh, look like. So as I said, we have four different tracers. Two of them are so-called anterograde tracers. So we inject them. The, these are uh, two different uh, colored viruses. And you can see that um, uh, they were injected here, taken up by the cell bodies, and you can see the uh, wires coming out of that uh, particular region of the brain. Um, this is another um, injection. Um, this is called BDA. Uh, a particular molecule called biotinylated dextran amine, and here is the injection site. Here in a distant part of the brain, you can see the projections that have arrived there. Um, then we also have these so-called retrograde injections, which are um, labeled cell bodies at a location away from the injection site. So what does it mean? Um, here's a place where I placed an anterograde injection that traces out all the trajectories that are coming out of that region, right? All the arrows that are pointing out. Um, the anter uh, sorry, the, the anterograde uh, injections are in green. The retrograde injections are the arrows that are pointing in. So that's the information that's coming in. Now, these two arrows are not necessarily symmetric. Region A might send uh, processes to region B, but region B may not send processes back. So even by injecting one region, we can start addressing interesting architectural questions about the brain, for example, um, does a particular region receive inputs from many different regions and send only one output? Or the other way around, receive input from only you, you, I'll actually show you an example of this. Um, these are not just theoretical uh, statements. Um, so you can kind of map out, in some sense, the local architecture with one injection. And then with multiple injections, the idea is you can map out uh, the, collect, the collection of all these things together, give you the global architecture. Of the, of the wiring of the brain. That's what we are doing. So now I'm going to show you uh, some data. So this is a, um, as I said, uh, um, anterograde, um, uh, this is a virus injection into a part of the brain called the motor cortex. Uh, um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but here are projections um, in a distant region. Here are wires running down to um, uh, the spinal cord. Uh, here, the injection site has been blown up, so you can uh, see the um, individual cell bodies. Um, here, in a distant location, you can see the um, uh, axons, and the swellings that you see are possibly synapses. So that's where the um, axon is making contact with another uh, neuron. Now, we stitch this information together, and I'm going to show you this little video. Um, of one of our injections. So this injection is placed in motor cortex. Um, and um, what you should see is a, a projection that is uh, going across the corpus callosum. Um, so the injection is on the left side, and so fibers crossing over from the left side to the right side. This is happening in your brain as well. So even though I'm showing you the mouse, the mouse are distant cousins. So in terms of the architecture of the motor cortex and the projections it sends, pretty much in your brain as well. Um, so you have your colossal projections going over to the other side. Uh, see this um, red? So we made an injection in uh, superficial layers in green, in, in deep layers in red. See this um, long tract? That's a corticospinal tract that's carrying uh, signals down from motor cortex down to the uh, spinal cord. Uh, but you can see that it kind of branches off into the thalamus, um, into the brainstem. And uh, from these uh, superficial regions, you can also see other um, this is a projection to a brain, uh, region of the brain called the striatum. Now I'm just going to put that into a video. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see that very well. I wonder if the lights can be dimmed for a couple of these videos. Um, uh, but uh, I, I had walked you uh, through. So you get a sense of this sort of three-dimensional um, pattern of projections that's coming out from... <coughs> um, let me play that uh, one more time for you. Um, 
So you, you get a sense of the wires coming out of the motor cortex. These are only the major kind of sets of wires. You can't really see all the fine detail at this uh, fairly coarse um, resolution. So Rishi, can it be seen? Yes. Yes, OK. All right. So next, let me show you one of the uh, retrograde uh, injections. So this injection, you can see, uh, was placed in a part of the brain. Uh, it landed in this part of the brain called the habanula, um, which um, is part of the epithalamus. So there's all these Latin names. I'm spouting them off. But um, just think of it as some part of, the, uh, some part of the brain for purposes of this talk. Um, and um, you can see labeled cell bodies there. Um, if you go to distant parts of the brain, then one sees retrogradely labeled cell bodies. And we reconstructed um, that uh, uh, brain. And I guess it's a little difficult to see. Uh, but you can see there is the medial habenula. Um, I'm going to play a video for you. But you can see sort of a scatter of neurons in other parts of the brain where people have expected uh, to see these neurons. If you go to the literature, for example, uh, then you'll see reports of these um, projecting neurons in some parts of the brain, but nobody has really taken a whole brain and looked at it at the same time, right? So that's sort of the strength of what we are doing. And here you can see this interesting example where the projections out of this particular part of the brain follow in one dense bundle, which is called the fasciculus retroflexus. Um, very Harry Potterish, <laughs> and uh, goes to this place called the interpeduncular nucleus. So this is a part of the brain which is receiving input from all these uh, cells that are scattered in the hypothalamus and the orbital cortex, and then sending one giant bundle of axons up. Why is it doing that is an interesting question, right? So there's a lot of these interesting questions that uh, uh, are coming up, and here's sort of a a visualization of that. I uh, apologize, you can't really see that very well, but there's a cloud of points which are the um, uh, inputs uh, to this uh, region. So um, e there's one of these videos are up on the uh, website, and if you are really interested, please send me email. I'll be happy to. There's a YouTube uh, link I can send you. So we have put up uh, um, uh, some of this data last June on this website. I do encourage you to go and visit. Um, uh, there's a list of injections which you can filter by the injection region. Um, that's that medial habenula injection that I was just showing you. And um, it won't show up very well on this display, but um, uh, you can look at the adjacent sort of uh, nissel stained section to see where the, all the cell bodies are. Um, uh, you can... Um, go to a, a reference atlas, which kind of orients you, that little uh, piece is called MH. Um, you can even, um, uh, th this is the most important thing, you can zoom in. So it's a virtual microscope. Um, you can keep zooming in until you see the individual cells. And it's sort of a great way, I think, to just learn a little bit about the brain when you look at it. Uh, looking is the first thing we do when we want to learn. So don't need to build your lab, don't need to have a microscope, go on the web and click. Um, so I, I do it myself, so it's not. Uh, and you can also search the literature for uh, information about these parts of the brain. We built a little a text uh, mining tool to um, uh, uh, see what papers have talked about these uh, uh, projections. OK, so um, I'm going to thank uh, a lot of people uh, by putting them on this slide. I'm not going to uh, work individually through these. but. Um, uh, several of the people in the lab, uh, especially the lab techs, actually joined after their undergraduate work. Um, and they have by now done enough work for a PhD. <laughs> but um, uh, m several people working very hard um, at the lab. Um, uh, Vadim Pinsky got his PhD uh, while doing this project. And uh, he was instrumental in uh, setting up the pipeline. He's a biomedical engineer by uh, uh, training. Uh, but, but really, it's, it's a team effort. Um, we work together. Um, and this is hard work, you know. This is not really visible. Things get into the media once in a while. People, uh, people are talking about the brain initiative, and there's a lot of excitement, which is really great. But what one has to realize is that neuroscience has been going on for a while. People working very hard at the lab for decades. Um, and that's going to continue. So uh, it is exciting uh, times. Um, I've had uh, support from a number of sources, including the 
um, NIH, um, initially from the Keck Foundation, which was very uh, useful. Um, and before I end, um, I want to just jump into a little bit of uh, an art project that I've been working on for uh, in relationship to brain sculpture. So I've been, uh, th this is by the way, um, can anyone tell me who, where this uh, drawing comes from? Any guesses? That's not Da Vinci, actually. It's a reasonably guess. No. Uh, it's uh, from Vesalius. Um, uh, Vesa there's, uh, uh, it, it, you can actually read here, Andre, Andrea Vesali. Um, so he made an illustrated book of neuroanatomy. But the interesting thing is the persons who painted or drew these things were not Vesalius himself, but artists in the studio of Titian, Titian. So there was this collaboration between the artists and the scientists, and, and it was interesting that you pointed to Da Vinci, because Da Vinci did a lot of anatomical drawings, and it was kind of this one moment, I think, in history where the artists and the scientists were asking exactly the same question using the same tools about gross anatomy. Um, that's difficult to replicate, because it's, it's okay to take a scientific thing as a subject of art, or, but there was this kind of convergence between the interests of the artists and the scientists, and some of the artists came up with scientific discoveries, uh, and Vesalius, you know, came up with these beautiful illustrations and collaborations with artists. So this is a modern, modernized version. Uh, um, friend has drawn this for me. Um, this is um, Hamlet, um, inspired by Vesalius. Um, but um, uh, my uh, uh, sculptor friend, uh, Frey Ilgen, in, in Berlin, I've been working with him for a, a couple of years. We are trying to make sculptural models of the nervous system. This is um, actually up on the web. Um, I want to say it has been a lot of fun. So um, not only is the nervous system wonderful to study, it's also beautiful. Um, you have to visualize it under a microscope. But, um, uh, so questions, uh, feel free to uh, email me, and I will stop and take questions now. Questions uh, from the audience for Dr. Mitra, uh, Sean, and then. Well, thank you for your great presentation. If I had more time, I would certainly want to pick your brain. No, no control. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I teach some of the sort of neuroanatomy um, at the undergraduate level, and, and I try to help the research uh, in, integrate the undergraduate research. And one of the things that I sort of try to explain to my students is that um, there's this idea that that um, we only use 10 to 15 to 20 percent of our brain. And um, my response, obviously, is just because we don't know what it does doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. How could you uh, help me draw a picture or explain that in more detail uh, with uh, applying the work that you do in your lab? Well, one way to do it would be to look at the connections. Yeah. So if you think that, well, this part of the brain is useful, well, look at what else is it connected to. And it just doesn't make sense that here's this useful part, and it's taking all this trouble to connect itself to all these different parts, and uh, it just doesn't make any logical sense. I mean, of course, this is a misconception, as you point out. Yeah. And how does, how does your work sort of tie into really uh, neuroplasticity, which is, again, how Well, um, prima facie, it doesn't, because we are trying to look at the uh, sort of the species-specific um, uh, structure. Now, you bring up an interesting point, which I should comment on. Of course, not everybody's brain is exactly the same. Um, if they were, we would be exactly the same person, which we aren't. Uh, but then on the other hand, our brains are more similar to each other than to, let's say, a chimpanzee brain. Um, it, there's a very a nice movie called uh, uh, Project Nim, uh, which I, ha has anyone seen Project Nim? It's about Nim Chimpsky. Do any of you know about Nim Chimpsky? Nim Chimpsky was this chimpanzee which was brought up, uh, baby chimpanzee. The idea was, it's named after Noam Chomsky, who came up with this notion that we have this um, special kind of genetically endow endowed language organ in our brain. So the idea was that, well, you know, if you brought up a chimpanzee in a human household, um, it would develop human language. You know, why not try? So this was the 60s, and people decided to try. Um, famous experiment. Um, but unfortunately, you know, Noam Chomsky didn't really develop <laughs> human language. So th there's differences between, um, you, there is plasticity, 
but there's not so much plasticity that you know you can completely change the brain so what we are trying to get at in the project is sort of the species typical if you want brain circuitry however um, if you have a traumatic brain injury you know axons may regrow um, there's of course plasticity at the synaptic level and all sorts of plasticity absolutely another question Yes, uh, uh, 56 uh, day prenatal uh, male. Uh, we do need to study female brains. Uh, this is uh, um, it's a funding uh, sort of thing, but people have, the Allen Institute has studied the male uh, C57 black 6 uh, strain, and we do the same. But more to come. Well, um, <clears throat> I, I believe that the brain has to be studied at many different levels of organization. So you can't really study it just at the anatomical level or just at the behavioral level, but you're asking how do we connect these things. And um, uh, one way has been classically through lesions, but what one really wants to do is to look at the circuit and ask how does the circuit give rise to the behavior that we see. So uh, one could do that um, by simply some of it will be perhaps even obvious uh, from the structure of the circuitry. If you look at the motor cortex, it's sending down um, the corticospinal tract. Uh, it stands to reason that it is affecting your um, uh, motor function. And this kind of functional anatomy people have done a lot. Uh, we will be able to do more. Um, there are other ways which is you stimulate the circuitry. So once you know how the circuit is laid out, then you start stimulating parts of it and see what behavior comes up um, using tools like optogenetics, for example, or uh, just electrical stimulation. And one can induce behavior. Knowing this logic of the circuit helps in designing those experiments. Question over here in the back. Now, it's interesting that you brought up the movie the Chipsky Goatball. Uh, the pro movie, movies, I think, called Project Nim. Project Nim, OK. Um, so of course, you, you explained that the chip didn't acquire human It did acquire communicative abilities. It's not that the chimp can't communicate. And I, I don't really want to spend, this is a very controversial topic, so I'm not going to, uh, people disagree about what exactly it learned and what exactly it did not learn. So there's some technical subtleties. Um, uh, the person who did the study has, uh, the chimp learned to communicate very effectively in order to get the rewards that it wanted, the food rewards or other rewards. It didn't learn syntactic structure, which is what, um, Chomsky was talking about, you know, this grammar thing. So um, there were some things that it did learn, and of course, monkeys and other animals have communicative systems, they have vocal communications. Sorry to clarify, is that the chip that learned like sign language, I think? It did learn sign, sign language, yeah. Oh. But it's not, lang it was not like sign, it learned to sign, okay. but whether you call it sign language, it depends on how you define sign language. So, but, you know, taking away all the details, the bottom line from that study, according to the investigator who did this study, and th this is a politically controversial subject because people really worry about how much plasticity there is in the brain. But um, the bottom line from that study was that the chimp did not learn human syntax. Was there a quick question over here in the back? And then, yeah, last question in the back. Go ahead. Um, um, you're using um, um, It's a, it's a great uh, it's a great question. I mean, I've been raising this question for a while uh, with various people. Like, why aren't we studying postmortem human brains more? A brain's a terrible thing to waste. I mean, there's so many <laughs> postmortem <laughs> brains. Uh, we are there now with the computational ability. Uh, what we do need are some technical developments because we can't really label these entire neurons, but we are making progress. But it's a very understudied area that deserves a lot more study. You've you hit upon a very important research topic. Last question from Dr. Josephs. Um, well, it follows on some of um, the last 
last question, because you mentioned that some of our ignorance comes from just technology, not, not having the technology available. Have you encountered um, ethical or moral resistance um, to your research? No, not me personally, but we are, of course, uh, um, the, these uh, experiments are done with the highest uh, standards in terms of care for the animals, um, and uh, they have to be thought through from the ethical, moral perspective. We don't do any unnecessary experiments. You know, so every experiment that we do has to be justified. There's a, um, uh, a committee that uh, you know consists both of scientists and non-scientists that uh, looks at the uh, study design and has to approve it. I cannot you know, on my own, decide to do this kind of study. I meant in terms of, of the, the results and what your results might be, how your results might be used. Um, this is knowledge. You know, knowledge always has good and bad uses. I would say that um, uh, in terms of our understanding of neuropsychiatric neurological disorders, this is one of our greatest challenges. I mean, as you've heard from uh, uh, Barack Obama talking about Alzheimer's and read New York, Times reports about how expensive Alzheimer's is going to be to the society, and we don't yet really know what um, causes it. So it's, um, I, I think that um, as scientists, we seek the truth and read the book of nature, and once one has understood what there is to understand, there's also the practical utility of it. My hope is that this will have uh, much more utility to society than otherwise. Yeah. Last question from Professor Moore. Thank you for joining us. Um, in the journalism program, we're getting plans together for a science journalism class. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is going on when it comes to trying to explain your work, your colleagues' work, uh, in the popular press, in the yeah. media? How is that going? Where is it strong? Where is it not? There are yeah. a lot of questions that we're trying to tackle as we plan this class. Yeah, I think this, this topic deserves a lot of study. In fact, if somebody's looking for a research project, this thing should be looked at because I think there's been a transition where there, uh, you know, it used to be that, like Richard Feynman was a great science communicator, Carl Sagan was a great science communicator. Um, uh, I'm not sure we have that style still. It, there's a lot of journalism that's going on. Uh, one thing that I find detrimental, I and mean, there are some great things about the journalism, by the way, I mean, it's bringing, uh, but one thing that I wish there was more of is communication of the primary knowledge, not just the latest and greatest thing, not what we learned yesterday, um, but communicating what is it that we know now um, with perspective, because that's something that journalists should do. Um, I wish there was more of that. That's education of the public in the best possible sense. There's too much emphasis on covering the latest research, and I wish there was more expository work. You think somebody like, uh, when I heard when I read your background about how you, your inter, interdisciplinary uh, approach, uh, the fact that you're at the, uh, what, what's, what's the name of the cafe? Cornelia. The Cornelia Street Cafe, yeah. the popular science, and it talks to the library. Um, your approach reminds me of somebody like Oliver Sacks. Well, I mean, Oliver Sacks does a, does a great job, and I, I believe in this. You know, I, I think that we have a duty as scientists, just as human beings, to, I have this desire that, you know, I learned about this cool thing I want to tell you. <laughs> Why am I doing it, right? And tell you in a way that you understand, not, I don't want you to be impressed about who I am, what I'm doing. It's really nature that we are all impressed about. And uh, I think there needs to be a lot more of that. Not so much sort of selling of science. I, I think that's been done plenty. But more communicating the knowledge that where we are in, in terms of understanding the world around us. Thank you. So let's thank Dr. Mitra. We're not going to let uh, Dr. Mitra sit down just yet. Um, I'm going to ask the provost um, to, uh, to invite um, one of our... Yeah. One of the things we're doing, Dr. Mitra, as I mentioned earlier, differently this year is some proclamation. And we were fortunate to get a proclamation for you. Oh. And so I'm going to invite Patrick with whom you share an alma mater, to read the first paragraph of the proclamation. You want to come, come around here? I am pleased to join my colleagues in this Council of the City of New York in congratulating you for being chosen the keynote speaker at this momentous occasion. The annual Student Research Day at York College, at which over 300 students are expected to participate, 
is a welcome example of the wonderful creativity and ability of the students at York College. Both they and their faculty mentors are to be commended, as should Dr. Rishi Nath, who was the first director of this program. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get one with Patrick and Dr. Mitra. From Harvard to York. Started from the bottom. Now we're here. No, no. Okay, one more thing, one more thing. We, we better... Drake is never in it. We can embarrass you a little further by giving you some other gifts. Oh my. Delighted that you're an interdisciplinary guy because we have a CD from one of our faculty in music, cool. embellishments, and we want you to embellish your further, you embellish further your collection Thank of you. music. Okay. Now, we know the value of, of your wide reading interests, and so we put some propaganda here for you. <laughs> uh, you know a little bit more about York and sell the, the value of what our faculty and students do. And there's some other goodies, so thanks Thank so much to you. Thank you so much. I want to really thank you all, and I, and I just want to say that it really reminds me of my undergraduate research days, and um, it's just so exciting to um, see that, uh, that you're doing uh, the same here. I feel really touched. Great. Thank you. And, and can we come visit your lab if we'd like to visit? Yes, so, um, and I do want to say that I um, especially, um, yeah, you're welcome to visit, um, and I also, if people would like to collaborate, online using the images. I'm trying to set up some online collaboration. Um, Lovely. Yeah. Great. Let's thank Dr. Mitra one last time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so now uh, what, we're, what we'd like to do at this point is to um, harken back to one of the um, research conversations that we had um, this year. Uh, one of the things that Provost Griffith asked me to do is to invite um, people, whether faculty or people from the community, uh, who are doing research involving their students. And uh, we had um, Carl Baenas, who's a York graduate, come in February during Black History Month and um, give us a wonderful talk on the hidden history of Jamaica, Queens, and York College. And one of the things we learned was that one of the first schools uh, for African American and Native American children at the turn of the century was located on your college's campus and that was an amazing discovery for many of us. Um, some of the, uh, of the things that Dr. Uh, that Mr. Carbolinus has done uh, include the Images in America series. So he's, he and his students at the Immaculate Conception School have written several books uh, on uh, with photographic uh, imagery and captions that are extremely illuminating. Um, and those of you who were here for his talk uh, will, will remember how, how uh, it left us all, all the more enriched. Um, so when uh, Provost Griffith and I were talking, we decided that we wanted to invite Carl back uh, because not only is he a great example of a mentor and a researcher in the community, but he's also an alum. And so in the program you can see that we have acknowledged him with our, our first Alumni Research Award. So I'd like to invite Carl Baenis up and read a proclamation that uh, has been made. So let's give him a round of applause and welcome him. So Carl, I'm not going to let you speak because if I do, we'll be we'll get a great history lesson. So what I what I what I will uh, do is read this, and then I'm going to invite everybody on the third floor. We have five beautiful images of Jamaica Queens. 1913 Jamaica Avenue. Uh, it's really a remarkable to see some of the things. These are all from Carl's personal collection. He allowed us to use them. We're going to find a way, uh, maybe with Dr. Namphy in the African American Resource Center, to make those available to people who want to see them after the day. Um, but right now, let me read this uh, a proclamation. And this is from the Council of the City of New York uh, to Carl Baenas. Greetings. I am joined by my colleagues in the Council of the City of New York in congratulating you upon being honored today at the Fort Student Research at York College. This is a tremendous day, and it goes on to say, 
that uh, uh, Carl Bayanis, you are a proud graduate of York as a distinguished researcher and scholar, winner of the History Channel Save Our Teacher Award, and one who's inspired your students to study and preserve local history. You have earned the gratitude of our city for your outstanding work on the histories of Jamaica, Queens, and York College, as well as Richmond Hill, Maple Grove Cemetery, Cemetery and Jamaica Estates. And I leave out any neighborhood in Queens, it's like every neighborhood. <laughs> um, I must also mention that your must praise direction of the research projects performed by the students of the Aquinas Honor Society at the Immaculate Conception School, Jamaica, Queens, where in conjunction with Victoria Brown of St. John's University Law School, you worked on the desegregation of Jamaica, Queens from 18... 95 to 1900, and that has become living history. So it goes on and on, but let's give Carl some congratulations. Let's have a picture. Thanks, Carl. Class of 76. Let's give him a round of applause. All right. um, at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Provost Griffith up to make some final remarks uh, and some awards. However, uh, I would like to remind people before I do that that there are panel sessions that are going on in 2A04, 2A15, 2B06, uh, the African American Resource Center, which is 3A, 3B04, and uh, 2C07. So it's in the it's in the pamphlet with the exception of 2B06 is the correct uh, uh, address for that. And as well, please circulate around the the campus for the second poster session and do stop on the third floor. I'm asking Carl to be available up there for uh, 45 minutes or so to talk to people about these beautiful images. Provost Griffith. Thank you. I have three three tasks. Task number one will be a thank you. Task, task number two will be an introduction. And task number three will be announcing faculty awards. So let's start with task number one. One of my regrets about the fourth, fourth research day is that Rishi Nath did not shock us once or twice by putting on a suit. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, at least has a tie. But he looks good. But he looks good. <laughs> good. I always get a kick when you see Rishi in a suit. Like, what? He has on a suit. Uh, but I want to thank Rishi Nath not only for being founding director of the initiative, and he may tell you that I had to twist his finger together because he said, Provost, I've never done this before. I said, maybe we can do it. Let's just try it. Last year, those of you who were at the third research day might recall I gave Rishi an award. And I wanted this year to give him something more personal as a gift of thanks. And so I consulted some of uh, the, inner circle, the inner Rishi circle. Uh, the faculty member of that inner Rishi circle didn't know what to give Rishi because he has so many interests. But then there was a student member of that inner Rishi circle who said, Robos, he likes all kind of music. Provost, he likes all kind of wine. Provost, he likes all kind of rum. So I said, okay, I got rum. <laughs> and so uh, I wanted to have Rishi come on up. Okay. I wanted to really give Rishi something personal that, as a way of saying thanks for great leadership. Great. Okay. <laughs> the rum did not break. I have the rum here. It didn't fall. Uh, wow. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to start something that lasts beyond a year or two. We've now come into the fourth year. And so be sure to drink this VAT 19 rum okay, well. Wow, Every sip, and don't give it to anyone. Every time you sip it, remember the work you, okay, the foundation you've made. <laughs> we also know that Rishi has a wide, a wide reading interest. And there's a new book by Ken Bain, and I thought, I'll give Rishi a copy of that book. It's uh, what the best college students do. Rishi, thank you. Thank you. Now, you can also keep this back. It's, uh... oh, okay. <laughs> but as Rishi said when, he, when we began the program, we're delighted that the work started with the faculty and staff support and the students will be continued by Robert Duncan, 
Robert Duncan is a psychology professor. Uh, we have great expectations of things he will do. Rishi was reluctant when I invited him, and so I gave a couple of hundred bucks for him to go someplace south, and he learned a few things. He'll be sending, are you going to the West Coast? Uh, yeah, yeah. He'll be going to the West Coast, come back with ideas of how we can build further on the research initiative that we started. So I wanted to introduce formally Robert Duncan as the new director of undergraduate research. Martha, one of the things we decided a few years ago, and we only were able to do it last year, is to acknowledge the work of faculty mentors in encouraging, sometimes really nudging students who don't think that research is their forte. And we decided to establish some awards for faculty who mentor at a certain level. And I'm delighted now to announce the award recipients for fourth research day. Since we want to make a very decent inscribed award, we're going to have to do this year what we did last year, have a separate event where the actual award is given to the faculty. But all the faculty names, we can remove that, uh, are on a poster, and I'll just tell you who those awards are. We've got three categories of awards. So for Dean's Award for Undergraduate Research Engagement, Hamid Bari from Foreign Languages, Robert Duncan from Behavioral Sciences, Nicholas Groskoff from Health and Physical Education, Susan Letney from Social Sciences, Yolanda Small from Chemistry. For the Provost Award for Undergraduate Research Engagement, Emmanuel Chan from Chemistry, Ian Hansen from Behavioral Sciences, Chun Ting Su from Accounting and Finance, and Jerry McNeil from Biology. For the President's Award for Undergraduate Research, and the President's Award is for faculty who mentors at least 15 students who presents today. Dev Chakravarti from Chemistry. Laura Beaton from Biology. Rakan Dar from Earth and Physical Sciences. Nazrul Kandakar from Earth and Physical Sciences, Mitch McNeil from Biology, Olajide Oladipo from Business and Economics, and Simon from Biology, Francisco Villegas from Behavioral Sciences. I think there's a, there's a Francisco chair section over there. And Tom Slabinger from Performing and Fine Arts. We're going to have a separate reception for the faculty to get the rewards. We come to the end of a day of poking and prying with a purpose. And I want to encourage Not even... Not the end yet. My, my corrections. We've come to the end of the luncheon section of the poking and prying with a purpose. So let's continue to see what the work is in the panels. Let's continue to hear what the work is in the panels and the poster sessions. And even if you grad you're graduating this year, don't forget the importance of continuing your formalized curiosity. Thank you.